I read with interest um, the headlines today about the woman in San Diego, I believe, or somewhere in Southern California, uh, Nassim Agdam, who had a quarrel with YouTube over filters or something like this, uh, popped her cork and went postal. Um, <clears throat> now this one is fascinating to me on many levels. Uh, first of all, um, for this notion that I've always sort of played with of toxic idealism, um, doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. Um, there's the old, do the, does the end justify the means, etc. If I'm an extremely angry person and I denounce everybody and embarrass everybody and rage at everybody because of some sort of good cause, some sort of um, righteous indignation that takes hold of me and it makes me angry at the world. In this case, I guess it's veganism, animal cruelty or something like that. Um, although I don't really know if that was a factor in her decision or impulse to go and shoot up a YouTube office. But it, you know, it's part of what she is, right? Um, I guess something of a crusader. I'm fascinated by the pictures that are appearing of her. Uh, very attractive woman. Um, she looks Persian, I think, or Turkish. And she's very beautiful in that particular Persian or Turkish way. Um, very careful to uh, pose in photographs. Um, the most famous one is her ni nicely dressed, coiffed and posed with an apple in her hand, being her lent and, um, leaning over a desk or something. Um, you know, a nod towards the veganism. What is going on behind those beautiful eyes of hers? Um, what is it that animates this, that fuels the machine that she is? Well, in hindsight, it looks as though it was all sort of rage. Um, you know how I've spoken before about people that look around and see how imperfect the world is and how much garbage goes on, and it essentially is too much for them. Um, Baudrillard's phenomenon of hyper-reality, where the reality of the media and of the internet, and I guess particularly the internet, um, and how it can sort of subtly take over um, the place that actual reality once had. It replaces actual reality. Or it creates an, a, a competing reality to the workaday reality. Um, the photographs of her show somebody very together, very poised and um, organized and all this sort of thing. Beautiful, uh, trying to make the world better, etc. But it's entirely possible that there was a great deal of cancerous hate in that person. Negative motivation, right? The motivation behind her quote-unquote good acts was, or may have been, quite negative. Um, not based on love of animals, but hatred of those who would hurt animals. I, I don't want to judge her for this. I'm just, I don't know the person and I don't really understand what could have possibly motivated her. And obviously there's so much to this that I, you know, I've only read a few articles on the net and I, I'm working on very incomplete information. So I don't want to judge her for this, but it, you know, you can piece it together in that way and it kind of makes sense, right? Um, you can see this kind of thing happening if you're not, if you don't just take things at face value. Um, <clears throat> as I say, some people, it would seem at least, want to be good people in order to um, give them the right or the obligation, I guess, of denouncing other people for their shortcomings and their moral failures, or just looking down on such people. Um, 
you know, it's it's kind of the stereotypical SoCal lifestyle. Aren't we wonderful? Aren't we holistic? We all go to yoga classes and we're all vegans and we have wheatgrass and passion fruit shakes for lunch and um, we're beautiful people, you know, this sort of thing. Um, but below the surface, you suspect that they're just human beings like everybody else. They're trying to be something that they're not. Occasionally, I suppose, people believe that it's a possibility to perfect the world or to even markedly improve the world. Uh, and again, in a self-help culture like the American culture, and in particular, I guess, Southern California, I think one can get sort of seduced into the idea that the reality of the rhetoric surrounding you, and you surround yourself with beautiful things and beautiful people and positive vibes and positive energy and, uh, you know, all this stuff in quotation marks, of course, um, you kind of lose touch with the way the world really is, or I can see that happening. Um, when you get to be sort of too, I guess, holistic, you can't handle the fact that that wheatgrass shake that you had eight hours later will come out your rectum something else. <coughs> that um, a lot of what is behind the scenes of perhaps even your own existence is not all that nice. And you can't handle it because you've kind of bought into the reality of the media. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. Not going to edit that out. Too lazy. Um, when your ideals clash with the underlying reality of the situation, what do you do? I can see that some people would pop their corks. It's the same thing as falling head over heels in love. <coughs> you get a completely unrealistic view of this other person of how life is or whatever. And say, for example, you're madly in love with somebody and one day they just tell you to get lost. You're crestfallen, of course. You don't want to go back to that reality, that the reality of life before you met this person. But this person is just another human being, right? Just as flawed as you are, but you put them on this extremely high pedestal and worship them or whatever in the way that that kind of all-consuming love works. And then either sooner or later you discover that this person is just another human being, just as flawed as anybody else, or this person dumps you. Um, and then you're in a worse position than before. This is the toxicity, I guess, of hope, the toxicity of idealism, the toxicity of um, thinking that things are too great when actually they're just... They're just the same old, same old of life, yourself, world, people, etc. Um, I think that that can be one of the most deflating and devastating even experiences of a lifetime. When you're living in this sort of cloud of wonder and beauty and everything, and suddenly reality smacks you in the face like stepping on a rake. It happens so quickly. Um, it's almost, you, you almost would have been better off had you never actually fallen in love or been seduced by these high ideals in the first place because you started to believe that this is the way things are and then when reality comes calling, you're just not ready for it. You're one of the people in Plato's cave who is suddenly grabbed and thrown out into the sun. <clears throat> you don't, you just don't have any means of grasping the reality that is actually more real than the reality that you'd lived in. Um, now, of course, the issue isn't so much that the feeling that you had, the wonderful feeling, is somehow wrong. It's just you were basing your feelings on mistaken information, right? You thought that the world was a certain way, therefore you felt wonderful about the world or about your life, or about reality, or whatever. It's not so much that that feeling was wrong, but that you'd based it on the wrong things. <clears throat> you'd based it on this idea that the world was perfectible, or that the world could be a wonderful place if we just make the commensurate efforts. Um, 
you know, it, it's the um, proverbial person who has it all, who's accomplished a lot in their life. They're say there's somebody living in New York City and they have a nice apartment that they own, a good job, a car, a wonderful circle of friends. Um, they um, live in a very pleasant place and they can sort of occasionally pat themselves on the back and say this is all the result of hard work and sane uh, choices and things like this. And one day they're sitting in their office in the World Trade Center and they look out and there's a big airplane about to smash right into them. Um, how much of our own existence and its value are in our control? Um, idealizing things that aren't necessarily as ideal as we think they are. Um, in a sense, you're blocking your eyes to these things, right? It, it goes back to the previous videos that I've made about, say, ritual animal slaughter. The world is made up of all kinds of things. It's made up of wonders. It's made up of beautiful things. It's made up of horrible things. It's made up of garbage, um, smelly fluids, this sort of thing. If you blot it all out, when it does eventually come calling, when reality does eventually come calling, it's going to be devastating. <clears throat> One of my favorite quotes of all is by Andre Gide, where he says, I would rather be hated for what I am than loved for what I am not. I think Kurt Cobain latched onto that as well. The toxic idealist, or I shouldn't say the toxic idealist, but the person who has fallen prey to or has been seduced by toxic idealism, loves the world for what it is not. Gaze into the pewter pot to see the world as the world is not. That's A.E. Hausman, a Shropshire lad, where it's, a, you know, he's implying, get drunk, and if you want to see the world for the way it isn't, get drunk. All idealism is ultimately a species of intoxication. Um, that when you wake up from it, you feel really bad. You have a headache, you know, usually that needle sticking right into your head, and your nerves are shattered, you may have done something stupid, you, know, you may be sick to your stomach or whatever. Um, when the reality of the situation, if you haven't sort of faced it, if you haven't faced the fact that there is a pile of shit and horror in the world, as well as all the good stuff, um, you're in trouble when you suddenly get knocked off that pedestal, or when your view of reality gets knocked off its pedestal. The young lady in California may have simply snapped because reality was too much for her. There was just too much rah, rah, rah. There was just too much self-help rhetoric. There was too much spreading the good news of veganism. There was too much faith in the perfectibility of the world. And we all know that some of the most dangerous people out there are frustrated idealists. And it's not so much their overt acts that make them dangerous. It's the fact that they won't look at things for what they really are. Um, I know that most people don't want to, and that's understandable. But I would argue that that's a choice. It's a choice to buy into in-group thinking. It's a choice to, or at least it's a something of a choice. It's a seduction. It's not really 100% my fault if I fall prey to enormous temptation. Um, in my bar stool days, I often got lucky, I guess, with women that were, as they say, out of my league. Um, <clears throat> Now, if I'd been rash enough to fall in love with women that I met in bars who were out of my league, if I had fallen madly in love with one of these beautiful women that just happened to be a little drunk, um, imagine what might have happened to me. Um, if, it's too, if it seems too good to be true, it almost certainly is, right? But 
it is my fault in that I allowed it to happen to me. I fell prey to the human, normal human desire to live, I guess, what one could call an exalted life, a sublime life. You want to spend your life on cloud nine. Something dangles that possibility in front of your eyes. You go for it against often your better judgment, or at least against the little voice in the back of your head that says, watch it. <laughs> uh, this is too good to be true. Therefore, it could be a trap. Um, then when you do discover that it was all crap or whatever, or that you'd made a mistake, or it was just a fluke, and you really shouldn't think that, you know, this one-off thing is really going to impact your life uh, positively for a long period of time, i.e. my example of getting lucky in a bar scene, um, I, <clears throat> I never really fell prey to that, just to be, <laughs> just to be um, clear, but I can see actually how people might. Um, realizing that you've been made a fool of, that you made a fool of yourself, that you believed in something that was impossible to actually be true or extremely unlikely, uh, is, I won't say it's completely your fault because there is, there was some basis for it, right? You were offered something or something was dangled in front of you that was wonderful out, out of the ordinary. So you think you're just one of the lucky people, right? Then it's taken away from you suddenly, and where are you left? Sadder but wiser, I suppose, for most of us. Um, but some people can't handle having the blinkers yanked off like that. After they have believed in the possibility of this wonderful ideal um, to suddenly be thrust back down into the morass, I guess, of everyday existence or at least the comparative morass um, of everyday existence. The problem isn't with the world itself. The problem is in our expectations of the world. And those expectations are often not as unrealistic as we think, at least based upon... how we expect the world to be. Like I said, if I'm rash enough to fall in madly in love with a gorgeous babe who I meet in a bar, um, it's, I have reasons for my sudden blind optimism that she is sitting there in front of me. But realistically speaking, things like that don't happen in the real world, right? Or if they do happen, they're going to end up ending when she sobers up, you sober up, and maybe she wasn't so good looking in the first place. Um, that's what being drunk is, right? At one moment, you had this high, high ideal. That ideal was taken from you. You can't handle it. Most people, I guess, as I say, are sadder and wiser at the end of the day. Other people, it breaks them, I guess. Um... They simply can't face the fact that it's just the same old world, regardless of how much luck they believed they had or how much work they had put into making everything wonderful. Um, I guess that's the religious concept of worldliness, right? You are attached to things of the world, even though most of what the world is is completely out of your control. You're building a... You're building your castle on marshland, right? Um, and I suppose we all have that in us, right? We all have in us deep desires, deep um, life outcomes that we would love to have take place. And again, life is constantly throwing these nebulous, ambiguous things at us that can hook us and make us believe that this world is a good place because something in us, whether we like to admit it or not, wants to believe that. That's the seduction of ideals, I guess. 